Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this important webinar. Uh, I'm honored to join you uh, as the moderator for this session. And before we begin, we would like to share that hundreds of viewers are joining us through the Tourism Webinar website, YouTube, and various social media. So we're so very happy that all of you are joining us this morning. We do have an important housekeeping rule. We ask you to please mute yourselves throughout all presentations. There's a lot of material to cover, so we really appreciate your understanding and support. So with that brief background, let us begin. As we all know, we have come together at a time when this nation and the world are facing great challenges on multiple fronts, including war, hate, division in society, and natural disasters ranging from massive fires to floods. I know that we're all saddened by the painful images we've seen on the Gulf Coast and the Northeast of the United States, as well as in Haiti and Afghanistan. People around the world are hurting and people are suffering so from COVID to climate change to hunger and homelessness. Everyone, please mute yourselves. Everyone, please mute yourselves. So it is in this context that we come together to, today to discuss stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination, and racism in travel and tourism. I wanna thank Mr. Reza Sultani for designing this webinar and assembling a truly distinguished panel of professionals who will share their thoughts and insights with us today from both their deep knowledge and their broad experiences in travel and tourism. Now, if it is okay with you, I thought I would kick off this session by sharing three brief vignettes of my own personal experience of engaging with the subject matter we will be discussing today. The first has to do with the experiences right here in the United States as a child growing up in the deep South. These experiences laid the foundation for what I would eventually encounter globally. When I was growing up in Georgia, my father was the chairman of the deacons board at our church. And my mother was president of the missionary society that was involved in providing support to families and churches in Africa. During the summers, my parents and I would travel to a statewide Baptist convention, which was often hosted by Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. This was the family church of Dr. King and the church he pastored. While I must date myself, it is important to note that this was during the period of segregation and black people were not permitted to stay in hotels. Because of that, Members of local churches would welcome us into their homes, prepare delicious meals, and make sure we were as comfortable as they could. And while I thought it was odd that we couldn't stay in hotels, I actually enjoyed the beautiful hospitality and rich fellowship with our hosts. Wonderful friendships were formed during those years. But this is yet another example of how black people made delicious lemonade from the lemons we were handed. Jackie Robinson shared a related experience of how he was not permitted to stay at a hotel in Philadelphia while on the road with his team. This resulted in the entire team refusing to stay there. So this was a phenomenon that was not limited to the South. The next two examples took place during global travels. The first incident happened during the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism's first global summit, which was held in Amman, Jordan in the year 2000. 
the King of Jordan served as the royal patron for the summit. This was my first trip to the Middle East and I was so excited. The headquarters for the summit was the Intercontinental Hotel. I arrived early to chair a meeting with our global coalition of partner organizations the day before the summit officially opened and I was really, really tired. So on the day of the opening plenary, I went to the men's section of the health club early that morning to get a sauna and steam before the commencement of what I know and knew was going to be a very long day. I was actually delighted to be the only person there and was able to relax for a while before a group of white men came in. I immediately noticed that they began pointing at me, whispering and talking among themselves as they kept looking in my direction. Now, not wanting to cause a scene, since I was on the board of the sponsoring organization of a major event taking place at the hotel, and since I was about to leave anyway, I prepared to depart. But as I departed, I looked directly at each and every one of those men as I was leaving to let them know I had as much right to be there as they did. But the story doesn't end there. Before the opening plenary, a grand processional of dignitaries and program participants was led through the hotel lobby into the grand ballroom where the opening plenary was taking place. I was in that procession. And I, as I looked over to people on the side who were viewing the processionals, I saw the same group of racist white men. They were pointing at me again, but this time they seemed clearly flabbergasted to see the object of their ridicule in a position of honor. I nodded my head and kept on marching in. God does have a sense of humor. The final example took place 10 years ago during a two week trip to Italy and France by three couples who were and are very close friends. Two African-American couples and a mixed couple, the husband African-American and the wife Japanese. The purpose of this wonderful excursion was to celebrate a special wedding anniversary of one of my best friends whom I had the honor of being his best man. After Rome, Florence, and attending the wedding of a friend's son at a castle in Tuscany, our last stop on the trip was Paris. We rented a large three bedroom penthouse apartment with two floors and views of the Eiffel Tower the Louvre, the Arc de Triomphe in the distance. It also included a beautiful wraparound terrace where we would hang out with a glass of wine, listen to jazz and enjoy the beautiful views of the city. While there, we had another friend, good friend from the States who was visiting Paris and we invited her to come to our apartment for dinner instead of going out. She quickly accepted and asked if she could bring a few friends who lived in Paris and whom she wanted us to meet. We said, of course. But since we had been out for most of the day, we decided to pick up some delicious rotisserie chickens and other makings for a sumptuous meal. I believe this was the 16th district, but I'm not quite sure. So we went to the commercial area to do some shopping and we divided the task. Being a Southern man, they said, Tim, you take care of the chicken. So I said, all right. So I spotted a nice size rotisserie and decided to go in. To my amazement, there was a Parisian woman behind the counter who showed immediate hostility and asked why I was there and what I wanted. She made it abundantly clear that my patronage was not welcome which was no problem because we could easily take our business elsewhere. So I walked out only to find an even more wonderful rotisserie with warm, beautiful people 
who gave us everything we needed and more for an incredible meal. Later, I was told that there was a re-emerging white nationalist movement in France that had a particular disdain for black people and immigrants who are people of color. Although it was 10 years ago, as we see, the more things change, the more they remain the same. Overall, the entire trip was truly exceptional, but that is a memory we will never forget. It is a shame that this is what we must contend with. But I believe as we start this webinar that we should never let racism stop us from experiencing this incredible world. So thank you for allowing me to share these few vignettes from some of my travel experiences. However, it is time now to hear from a true giant in travel and tourism. He is a recently retired Secretary General of the United Nations World Tourism Organization and currently Chairman of the International Advisory Board of the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism. He is revered in every corner of the globe and we are so blessed to have him with us. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Dr. Caleb Rifai. Thank you so much, Timothy. You're very kind, you're very generous as usual. Thank you for sharing these stories with us. I want to start by saying something that may sound a bit controversial, but travel is a human right, just like any other human rights that are there. I think this is a principle that we should always maintain. It's important to know that everybody has the right to travel, not only those that have it, also those that don't, not only whites, Africans, everybody has the right to travel. That's why COVID-19 now revealed so many things for us. COVID-19 made us do four things. One is emphasize the importance of domestic and regional tourism, which is very important because a country, another principle I want to share with you, a country that's not enjoyed by its own people could not be and should not be enjoyed by anybody else from outside. We should never ever look at tourism only in the eyes of a blonde or, or a blue-eyed person coming as if he's coming from Mars, being treated in, in, in a majestic way, while the people of the country are suffering. You can't anymore build five-star hotels in three, three-star communities. You can't do that anymore. It's not acceptable. Timothy, what you pass through is very, very real, very important. But you should never, ever look at travel as something that is away from you. It's your right to travel. It's everybody's right to travel. That's an important thing. Now, the rise of domestic and regional tourism was one of the byproducts of, of the COVID-19. COVID-19 is a crisis. But in Chinese language, the word crisis and the word opportunity are one word. We don't distinguish them from one. There is a silver liner in every crisis, and this one, silver liners. In four years ago, I was interviewed by a Portuguese newspaper who asked me, what do you think the world will happen? Trump was just elected and he imposed a travel ban, which we all opposed. Secondly, there was terrorism all over the place. Thirdly, there was Brexit in the horizon. I said, look, tourism is a very sensitive industry. It will decline for a little while, but by next year, it will go back to where it was. And it did. This time, I don't think we're going back to where we were. I think we would lead forward, not go backwards. It's a very important concept to share with you. We're going to go to a different new world, a better world after COVID, if there is after COVID. The new reality is different. Now this new reality may demand in some eyes of some people that you all have to have money because tourism has to be sustainable. Now, sustainability doesn't have to be paid for at all. Sustainability is about you being responsible travelers. You can be responsible travelers, no matter what our color of our skin is, no matter how much money we have. To start with, it's very, very bad to say that tourism, sustainability has a price. Sustainability is not just about the environment, although the environment is very, very important. 
environment. You know, tourism is known to have contributed to 5% of the carbon footprint of the world. It's five, not 15, not 20, but it's five too many. We need to share our responsibility in this one. And we are going to do that. We are. We're doing that every day as we, as we live by. Because I believe that mankind will prevail. We're living in a better world today. The days that Timothy was talking about in the States are behind us now. The whole world is looking at the States. It's not the United States anymore. It's the divided States of America because of COVID. Every country, every state is acting on its own. Now, COVID has brought responsibility down to governments. Every government is acting on its own. No matter how good your government is, it doesn't work unless we all work together. Working together is a multilateral system. Our multilateral system has already failed us. Multilateral system has failed us. Please. You need to mute yourself, please. Thank you. I know black lives matter. They matter a lot to me, to everybody else. And what we need to remind ourselves is one very important thing. We all came out of Africa after all. I wanted to watch the BBC series called The Journey of Man to see how we all came out of East Africa. Every human being in the world. Then we went all over the world. We settled in different places. We're all Africans. I feel African myself. I'm the patron of African Tourism Board only because I believe in Africa. I believe the future is Africa. And in this COVID-19, future of Africa is being more set clear. Africa is a beautiful continent. I may not have the right color of skin, but I'm African at heart. I was born in Africa. I was born in Egypt, in Cairo. So I can claim that I'm African. Everybody should claim that he is African, he or she is African. This is an important fact to establish. Nobody, nobody that's living on this world today came out of any place other than the Bushmen in East Africa. That's what the story is. It's a fact. Therefore, let me go back to the main principle. Travel is a human right today. Like every other human activity, travel and tourism has its downsides also. Downsides has been discrimination and apartheid and all of that. But this would go away with time. If we insist on doing that, I must thank Louis de Mori and the of Sultan for bringing us together under this very important title. Because it's important to, to note that without us being conscious and aware of the world around, we will never be able to make a change. Travel and tourism today is a wonderful industry. It makes all of us open our eyes, open our minds, open our hearts to see the world, its diplomacy in its best form. That's why it's being used by some tyrants, by some right-wing fascists to block people from going from one place to another. And it's used also in examples like the ones that we just spoke about. These are all examples of the past. We must together work together to build a better world. This multilateral system that has built us now is going to become a better system. Look at Europe, for example. Europe is a continent that we all looked at and we admired the structure of the European Union. But you have three countries. One is insisting on a blockade. On, a, on a, When you come in, you have to quarantine. The second is insisting on a vaccine passport. Third country is okay, 72 hour system. Three systems within one continent. That doesn't work. Governments have to sit together. They shouldn't leave the room before agreeing on something. That's how it should be. And the vaccine also is another example of this discrimination. You can't just depend on vaccine. Vaccine is, a, is falling into the game of those that have it and those that don't have it. How can a country that cannot vaccine its people send people or receive people from countries that have vaccine? I think testing is the best way of going about it. But it's a matter of governments to sit down and agree on that. If they decide that vaccine is the best, we should provide vaccine to every country in the world. We should not leave any country behind. Africans should not be left behind in this kind of a game. It's a game, truly. I therefore urge all of you to work together, to encourage your governments to work together, because without governments working together, 
you cannot see any vaccine and cannot see any end to this COVID-19. COVID-19 is an opportunity for us to build a better world. And we are, we're going to, we're leaping into the future, we're not going back to where we were. Not less people will travel, more people will travel. Today, one, one out of seven of the people of the world make an international trip outside of their country every year. One out of seven. The others are traveling within the country domestically, which is important. But it's important to set the rules for travel. And it's up to governments, it's up to destinations to set that rule. Thank you so much. I'll stop at this point and I'm ready to answer any questions or react to any of comments that have been. Thank you so much, Timothy. Thank you, Reza. Thank you, Lou. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Dr. Talib. Thank you very much. Welcome. Timothy, please. Yes, I had to unmute myself, sir. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Rafai. From this point, we will ask each speaker to share a little about their wonderful background as they make their presentation. Our next speaker is Miss Gloria Herbert, who along with her husband, Solomon, is co-founder and publisher of Black Meetings and Tourism USA. They are regarded as among the distinguished <clears throat> leading professionals in the field. Please join me in welcoming Miss Gloria Herbert. Thank you so much, Timothy. It's a pleasure to sit among these very distinguished panelists and to share some of our ideas. Yes, you're right. My husband, Solomon, and I have been publishing Black Meetings and Tourism, which is a trade publication for the travel and hospitality industry for over 30 years. Our publication and our focus is all about the business of travel. Timothy, we can all probably relate in many ways to the experiences that you shared with us. In our world today, in this country, most Americans consider the freedom of travel as one of those inalienable rights like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But there was a time in the not too distant past when African American travelers, especially those traveling by car, were not permitted to stay in most hotels, eat in many restaurants, use public restrooms, or even buy gasoline at all service stations. And in fact, their lives could be jeopardized if they traveled to certain destinations at a particular time of day. To address that challenge, Victor Hugo Green, who was an African-American postal worker, created what was called the Green Book. This was a directory that listed places which provided accommodations and services where Black travelers would be welcomed and would be safe. Many of you are familiar, of course, with the film that popularized uh, that um, book because it's uh, of its name, Green Book. For people of color traveling in the U.S., that guide was an absolute life-saving necessity. In addition, however, to providing information about lodging and food and gasoline, these guides featured Black-owned businesses and services, everything from hair salons to medical offices and I guess everything in between. The Green Book was literally a treasure for African-American business and commerce. And in fact, the historic Green Book created a very unique system for employment opportunities and for economic empowerment because it brought a steady stream of revenue into many Black communities throughout the country and actually into some international destinations as well. Well, let's fast forward a little bit to 2019. African-Americans are traveling at a rate never before seen in this country. They can travel to any destination. They can stay at any hotel, eat in any restaurant, and go to any attraction that their budgets will allow. So certainly at that level, 
African Americans are free to enjoy the wonderful experiences that travel has to offer. Actually, according to a recent report, the African American segment is one of the fastest growing markets in the travel industry. It generates upwards of $118 billion in annual revenue. But in terms of true equality, inclusion, and economic empowerment, the question still remains, how much of that revenue benefits African-American communities? Well, to answer that question, let's just take a quick look at the US travel industry from the top down to see how the representation stacks up in the leadership space. There are over 700 official destination travel and tourism offices around the world. And yet there are only eight African-American presidents heading up any of these bureaus, which is slightly, perhaps that's just a bit over 1%. And I might add very quickly that among those, only three are women. Throughout every component of the travel industry, whether it's lodging, cruise lines, airlines, there are very few or no African-Americans or other people of color in leadership positions. And just as importantly, there is little or no diversity on the corporate boards in travel, tourism, meetings, and hospitality organizations. This is also reflected in the industry's record of extremely low numbers for recruiting, hiring, and promoting highly skilled and qualified people of color. You and I know that when students and other young people don't see individuals who look like themselves in leadership positions, they rarely seek careers in that industry. In terms of investments in the market, the numbers there are even more alarming. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> it has been reported, <clears throat> I'm sure Kitty can relate to this. <clears throat> Excuse me. That less than 4% of destination marketing organizations spend their advertising and marketing dollars <clears throat> with black owned media. And the records are even lower percentages for lodging and cruises and airlines. As far as sponsorship dollars go, it's very clear that the major players are more willing to sponsor general market association conferences and events than those of African-American and multicultural organizations. Several years ago, the NAACP, which is one of the oldest and largest civil rights organizations in our country, launched a national lodging industry report card that rated the nation's major hotel brands regarding their policies for diversity and inclusion. This report card was widely embraced not only by African-American travelers, but also by the US traveling public at large. And it resulted in many of the hotel brands making major improvements in their business practices across the board. African-Americans and people of color who previously had been overlooked were promoted to top level positions. The hotel brands used black owned media to market to black travelers. They developed programs to encourage black hotel ownership and they created scholarship opportunities for aspiring black students who were stu studying travel and hospitality. However, when the NAACP chose to no longer issue that annual report card, almost all of those efforts were quickly discontinued. So while on the one hand, African-Americans have demonstrated enormous progress in achieving equality in the travel and hospitality and tourism industry, clearly there's a great deal of room for improvement, especially to increase the potential for those billions of African-American travel dollars to provide economic benefits to communities of color. So again, to address this issue, 
with that in mind, enters what is called the New Green Book. This is a historically inspired, of course, by the, hist by the old green book of the last century. The National Gr New Green Book for Travel is the 21st century version of that. It's a digital directory. It's scheduled to launch next February. And this handy guide will provide online linkages to any traveler to connect them to all the resources they need when they're traveling to a destination in the US, as well as some international destinations. In addition, it will provide listings for African-American businesses, heritage sites, and venues throughout the country. This digital directory will showcase places that actively invite and welcome all visitors. All visitors to explore, to enjoy, to be enriched by everything their destinations have to offer. The new Green Book for Travel is just one of several travel initiatives in the United States that are being implemented to address the effects of stereotypes of prejudice, discrimination, and racism. And hopefully it will help to add, to give life actually, to Mark Twain's famous statement, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Thank you for your time and your attention. Oh, thank you so much, Ms. Herbert. Thank you. thank you, that was excellent. We're now delighted to welcome Dr. Kang J. Jerry Lee, Assistant Professor in the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management at North Carolina State University. He will share with us some of the findings from his award-winning scholarly research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lee. Thank you so much for the nice introduction, uh, Mr. Marshall. Um, this is such a pleasure to be included in, in this wonderful event. And it's such an honor to be a part of this you know, amazing and wonderful speakers. Um, so I'm gonna do my screen share. Um, I believe you can see my PowerPoint. Uh, can you see it? Yes, yes sir. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, so today I'm gonna talk about institutional racism in nature tourism in the United States. And um, I'm gonna do some brief, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> brief introduction about myself. Uh, so I'm an assistant professor, I'm an academia uh, at Parks Recreation Tourism Management at North Carolina State University. And I am a sociologist by training. I tended to focus on sociology and social psychology of leisure. And race, ethnicity, racial discrimination, stereotypes, these are some of the main research topics that I have been uh, uh, studying throughout my academic career. So I'm really thrilled and excited by this opportunity to share my findings. So my presentation today is mainly about uh, nature tourism in the United States. Um, so we are talking about visiting national parks, visiting national forests, and doing camping and outdoor recreation. Um, according to one estimation in 2019, Visiting national parks generate nearly $42 billion throughout the communities around national parks. So it has a very significant economic impact. And also, uh, after Great Depression and World War II, national park uh, visiting these uh, beautiful places and engaging in outdoor recreation um, became a major component of American lifestyle. Uh, this is sort of a major American uh, leisure activity. And national parks, I mean, they emerge as, as a sort of a symbol of national identity and patriotism. But what is interesting about um, this visiting national parks is that if you look at the uh, uh, racial and ethnicity of these visitors, people who actually visit these national parks and national forests, and there's a pretty clear uh, racial and ethnic disparities. This is a statistic from Great Smoky Mountain National Park, which is the most visited, the most popular national park in the United States. I mean, if you see it, I mean, it's so clear that overwhelming majority of visitors to this park is white Americans. 
and people of color, such as Hispanics and Blacks, uh, they are only a fraction of the total visitor of this particular park. But if you compare these statistics with other national parks, you can see the same, uh, almost the same pattern. Uh, one of the major destinations for uh, nature tourism is national forest in the US. And again, you can see the same type of racial and ethnic disparities. And, um, you know, in 2019 report, uh, it documented that 97% of uh, national forest visitors were white American. And if you look at uh, African American population, which is purple color in this pie chart, uh, it's only 1.2% which is a significantly, it's a substantially lower proportion compared to the general population because African-Americans usually 14% uh, of the US population. So we are talking about a huge gap between nations, African-American population and people who actually visit or partake in nature tourism. So if you see these statistics, then you start to have some questions and is this something important? Is this something that we need to pay attention? And if so, why is this happening? We have to understand the cause of what is actually causing this type of racial and you know, ethnic disparities. And once you identify the you know, cause of this issue, then we have to ask, what can we do about this type of situation? So I'm gonna address these questions one by one in today's my presentation. So first question is, is this important? I think this is very easy. Um, as a lot of you already mentioned, uh, tourism is about human rights. And tourism is about educational opportunities. And tourism, many empirical studies show that tourism, nature tourism in particular, provides many, many health benefits. And also, uh, there is a substantial body of uh, literature in tourism scholarship that nature tourism is closely related to life satisfaction and well being. So, if we are talking about these benefits, these benefits are disproportionately enjoyed by white Americans then we are essentially talking about social justice issue here. We are talking about discrimination. We are talking about equity issue. So this is the reason why uh, this is something very, very important. Then, okay, the next question will be, uh, that we have to address will be, why is this happening? Um, previously, many researchers talk about income level. I mean, it is true that white Americans make disproportionately higher income than uh, African Americans or Hispanics. But even though income levels are similar, even though African Americans have higher income level, black middle class and upper class, they tended to engage in outdoor recreation or visiting you know, nature tourism destination far less likely than white Americans. So it doesn't really provide a strong uh, explanation. The second explanation is culture. Uh, the idea is that um, African Americans have a very distinctive culture that do not see nature tourism as an ideal sort of recreational uh, uh, experience. Um, but this explanation is also uh, very weak. It doesn't have a very strong empirical findings and previous findings have been very mixed. And if we emphasize culture too much, it, it becomes cultural determinism and it prevents us to engage in scientific discussion. So today uh, I'm gonna as an alternative explanation, to me, this is the most convincing and reasonable explanation, which is the history of institutional racism in American great outdoors. What I mean by this is that, you know, since last year, a lot of Americans became aware of the issues related to systemic racism and institutional racism. So that's exactly what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, for national parks, um, we have to understand how nature has been conceptualized in this country. So nature, wilderness, great outdoors started to emerge during the mid and late 1800s in the United States during American conservation movement. And at that time, American cities are experiencing rapid urbanization, uh, people, high population density, uh, diseases, and lack of infrastructures and pollutions. And so uh, during this time, a lot of urban white elites, uh, white politicians, and journal editors and businessmen, very, very powerful, rich individuals start to romanticize wilderness. And during this process, they start to create this interesting dichotomy between city and wilderness. City is usually associated with something negative, dirty, dangerous, and many, filled with many immigrants and people of color. 
But they conceptualize wilderness as clean, safe, and ideal environment. And when they do that, they start to associate nature with white American, white race. And then uh, this type of uh, racial connotation of American wilderness was further strengthened by eugenics. Eugenics is basically a study or social movement to improve the generic composition of the human race, meaning that it argues that certain racial and ethnic groups are smarter, sparier, stronger than any other racial groups. So it has a very strong racist uh, idea. And many national park leaders actually believe nature preservation, such as creating national park, is an important task for maintaining white dominance because they saw that nature, great outdoor, is an ideal context for white Americans to be, you know, develop their uh, strong uh, personality and intelligence. And one of such individuals was Madison Grant. He was a lawyer and zoologist, and he, he made a tireless contribution to the creation of many national parks in the West, in the United States. And he was a very strong eugenicist. And he believed that um, white Americans is the most superior racial groups, and white Americans need to, this particular race needs to be preserved in order for the prosperity of this country. And similar argument was made by one of his friends, who was Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, he was a 26th president of the United States, made numerous contributions to the preservation of wilderness. But his intention of preserving this na uh, nature was actually closely tied to his ideology, uh, eugenicist ideology. He saw that the uh, uh, nature, again, is uh, the best ideal context for white Americans to thrive. And this is the place that white Americans can learn uh, many knowledges and personalities uh, than any other social context. And then this type of eugenic and racist foundation of American conservation movement and nature-based uh, tourism were supported by institutional racism such as Jim Crow. And so these are pictures. Uh, you see these two pictures taken at uh, Shenandoah National Park. And you can see that these are specific park areas for African-Americans because they are not allowed to use the same facility that white Americans are using. Uh, and this type of facilities exist. Uh, well, first of all, these places are usually inferior in terms of aesthetic value and functionality. And these type of facilities are actually quite rare. So if it's lucky for African-Americans to have these type of segregated parks. And uh, state park is another example. Uh, I talk about national parks exclusively, but state parks is another major tourism, nature tourism destination in the United States. And according to the study conducted in 1950 during the Jim Crow era, there are 180 state parks available for white Americans throughout certain states. We are talking about Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, uh, Florida, South and North Carolina. And there are only 18 parks available for, 18 state parks available for African Americans. So we are talking about almost 10 times difference in terms of the uh, available park number of state parks available for African Americans. But if you look at the uh, uh, the actual size of the park, the gap is even more substantial. Basically, African American had less than 1%, less than 1% of the state parks that are enjoyed by white America. So if you look at these historical you know, context, from the very beginning, uh, white park leaders, nature tourism leaders, nurtured the idea and the reality of this nature tourism as an activity for the prosperity and benefit of the white race. And they are the primary user. These American white wilderness was conceptualized as quote unquote white space. And then this foundation was supported by Jim Crow or institutional racism. And it was you know, uh, maintained until the 1960s. So these historical circumstances, uh, it's, it's no doubt that created enormous challenge for generations of African-Americans to gain experience, knowledge, and skills in nature-based tourism activities and prevented them 
to develop this cultural inclination, disposition to appreciate and understand this type of leisure activity. So today we see a lot of racial and ethnic disparities in nature tourism, but this is actually the legacy of historical racial oppression. So what can we do about this? I mean, this is a depressing and very stressful and uh, you know, historical context, I, but how can we change this pattern? How can we move forward and how can we you know, move beyond this history of uh, horrible racist ideology? Well, there are many different things that I believe we can do, but in this presentation, I, I'm gonna briefly mention two things. Um, I think, first of all, we need more, um, more people of color in our environmental and park leaders. If you look at the history of National Park Service and National Forest, um, they have a long history, but throughout their organizational history, they only had, they only had one African-American director. Um, and until recently, Forest Service didn't have uh, you know, any uh, non-white individual in the history of their directors. This year, the organization, the agency had first African-American director of National Forest. And similarly, National Park Service had only one African-American director throughout its organization history. So I think this is, uh, uh, you know, unfortunate. I think in order for the next generation <clears throat> to understand that this is not only about white America, this is, uh, uh, it's a symbolic meaning and representational issue that we have more environmental and park leaders from people of color. The second, <clears throat> I guess, uh, recommendation that I will make is that uh, we need to highlight the history of uh, Black accomplishment in nature tourism. Despite of all of these you know, challenges, African-Americans were the one who set the foundation of nature tourism and national parks. And a lot of people don't know about this. So for example, Captain Charles Young, <clears throat> he was the first Black national, national park superintendent. And and also there are many Buffalo soldiers, African-American soldiers uh, in many uh, national parks areas in California and Western states. And they were the first, uh, first park rangers. Uh, they maintain park. Uh, they, uh, uh, they sometimes, you know, operated as tour, tour guide. So if we highlight these black accomplishments in the nature, and I think we can change our stereotype of nature tourism as white activity. And I think we can make this, uh, this particular activity as more inclusive and more uh, just uh, uh, sort of uh, leisure recreation activity. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide and for the uh, uh, time being. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. That was really an excellent presentation, a lot of, um, very important information. Thank you so much. Our next presenter is Ms. Depika Sen, the founder and president of a classic tours collection and also creator of the Women's Empowerment Tour, both which provide unique immersive tour experiences for participants. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Debeka Sen. Thank you, Timothy Marshall and Reza for having me here. I do appreciate being part of this panel and there are a lot of things I'm learning today about African-American history. I thought I knew everything, but you never do till you depart from this world. What I um, want to talk about is when we talk about racism, we have to talk about inclusion of our own community, where we do have racism within ourselves, within our own people. And I'll talk about India, for example. Uh, we had colonialism. We were, we were a society that was very fractioned. We were, never we were divided. We never came together. So when foreigners came to India, it was very easy for them to annex uh, to take over India and rule it as their own country. Indians in our own 
we in our own country were excluded from being members of uh, parks or being invited to the same parties. We had our own apartheid in India, but in a different format altogether. And I find that we Indians, um, we look at each other's skin colors and we become very racist about it. I have experienced it in my own country before I even talk about America or any other society. And I think we need to come together. Yeah. What I want to state is I come from a racial and uh, a biracial background. My mother was white, Jewish. My father was Indian. And you could say he was black because he was very, very dark, Indian, Hindu. And I was brought up in a home where color was never discussed. I assumed everybody was like me, that we came from this kind of background and it's okay. Um, it was only during my childhood did I realize that my father in the early 60s, I believe, he went to Mumbai and he wanted to join a club. And they wouldn't allow him to enter the club because he was Indian. There was this archaic law that was instituted during the time of the British when they were ruling India. Indians were not allowed to be members. To think that in 1947, we got our freedom that in India, we still considered ourselves to be um, uh, inferior, that we were, we were not allowed to be members in our own clubs, in our own country. So my father created a massive um, media campaign to fight this and he took it to the Supreme Court and he was the one who overturned this ruling. And now Indians are members in clubs in India. When I came into tourism, I never really gave much thought to racism. And the only time I really, uh, it really touched me was in America, as I mentioned in my previous conversations when I've had with people. During the Trump era, when Trump became president, I was refused entry into a restaurant. You read about it in books. You read about how African-Americans were refused to allow to enter restaurants. But until and unless it happens to you, do you feel the impact of that? And I realized as a, a community, we need to come together and we need to talk about how do we fight racism, but we need to start with ourselves first. And I had to answer for myself, am I racist? And what is racism? Is it about color? Is it gender? What about religion? I have been called, um, I remember when 9-11 happened, I had somebody call me a Paki. You know, I'm not Pakistani. Get to know me first before you make an accusation. And don't call somebody a Paki because that's very, very racist. Everybody is the same at the end of the day. And Pakistanis are very proud people. They have a great history and they have a lot to offer in this world. And I think it, um, I, what I have decided to do in tourism is one soul at a time, whoever knocks at my door and wants to travel, I have them travel to a certain destination and I have them intermingle with the local people in that particular country. And I find that when you change one person, it has a dominoes effect and you change a lot of lives after that. Um, and I feel during this phase right now, what we're going through, uh, I, I love what Black Lives is doing. They do matter. But where I say don't cause a division, all lives matter. We're all important and we all need to come together and talk about this and make it a healthy atmosphere. I wish to end by saying what Dr. Martin Luther King would say. Um, I forgot. <laughs> um, judge me, you know, you have to judge me for who I am, not by the color of my skin. It, it's not important. My soul is more important and who I am and what I stand for and my community. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Sen. Thank you very much. Um, well, it is a delight to introduce our next presenter who is regarded as one of the preeminent leaders 
in the field of cultural heritage tourism. She is Miss Kitty Pope, the co-founder and publisher of AfricanDiasporaTourism.com and the associate director of the National Cultural Heritage Tourism Center. She is a dear friend of the founder and president of IIPT, whose board I chair. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Ms. Kitty Pope. You need to unmute yourself. You need to be unmuted. Okay, I just yes. said hello to everyone. Yes. And I wanted to get started by um, telling you that I started my travel career as a, in a response to the lack of inclusion and diversity that I was seeing in the travel industry. I was at the time the travel editor of a major magazine, the Black Magazine, and as editor, I was able to um, visit different destinations and do the press trips. During these press trips, we went to her historic heritage sites um, in there, many different places around the, around the US as well as around the world. And I noticed that most heritage sites at that time, which was probably about 15 years ago, did not have much about black history and um, I was a little bit, well, a whole lot concerned about that. I remember one incident, uh, we went to a heritage site in Pennsylvania and we visited a place, uh, a site where um, they talked about how the Const US constitution was formed and all of it was about white people. And believe it or not, most of the black travel writers that were there on the press trip sort of gravitated out of the room. And then we all met, not planned, but outside. I think it was out of boredom. And I can say, I can imagine what the students in classes are feeling when they only learn about, um, you know, what white, the white part of history. So from that, I also noticed that most of the travel writers on press trip were mostly white. So I just started thinking we need more black participation in uh, travel media. And out of this observation, I knew that I wanted to be involved in cultural heritage tourism. From there, I formed the International Association of Black Travel Writers with the few black travel writers that, that I did uh, travel with on some of the press trips. It wasn't as exclusively for black people. It wasn't about the color of the skin, but the organization was more about stimulating black travel and promoting heritage and historic trails. I know that the travel media was and still is one of the best and most effective influential tools that we can, that we can use to help open doors and bring awareness to uh, cultural heritage travel. And from the um, organization of travel writers that I formed, I later formed the African Diaspora Tourism. And that was created with the sole purpose of promoting, promoting Black heritage, cultural heritage tourism trails. And from that, I hosted several events, including the um, African Diaspora World Tourism Awards where we honored movers and shakers in the industry. I think that culture heritage is, tourism is important because it helps to educate the public about the contributions of, in particular for my website, African Diaspora Tourism, of black people all over the world, people of African descent all over the world. These types of events uh, stimulate cultural heritage tourism and can also uh, combat racism or at least promote diversity and inclusion by bringing awareness to Black contributions and making the public and communities know that Black influence has been left out of the travel industry. This is a way to educate the public about heritage sites. Education will play a key part 
in um, combating racism and um, uh, promoting diversity and exclusion. Because believe it or not, many of the people that visit the Black Heritage Trails are whites or non-Blacks. And um, it, as I was saying, the Heritage Trails, the Black Heritage Trails are visited by a lot of non-Black people. And in many cities around the world, one of the major draws for that city is a Black heritage site or tourism trails. This is true of, in Atlanta, the Martin Luther King site is the number one site, uh, heritage site visit. And it used to be in the world, I don't know if it's still, not the world, but the US in the country, I don't know if it still is. And second to that is the Martin Luther King Memorial in Washington, DC. Okay. Okay. The same okay. thing happens okay. with Please mute yourself. Please mute yourself. Okay, in Macon, Georgia, they have the um, Harriet, Harriet, Harriet Tubman Museum, which is the most, puts, sort of puts Macon on the map. That's the most visited heritage sites. So I, I think that this shows that all people are interested in learning about Black history because Black history is a part of America's history and everyone's history everywhere where there's people of African descent all around the world. Now, just recently, I went to Montgomery to visit the um, Lynchon Museum. And when I was there, most of the people who were there were non-Black people. White people were there to learn about uh, the lynchings that took place in America and um, because they know that it's a part of their history. That's why I believe that media is very important, especially in terms of educating the public. And what I'd like to see more of in the media is more of the press trips um, geared toward recruiting Black travel writers and promoting the heritage, Black Heritage Trail in each city to help people to learn about and educate the public about Black contributions. Now, I know that Bermuda, the Bermuda Tourism Board is doing that. They target Black travelers with specialty programs with promoting heritage sites and that type thing. And I would love to see other tourism boards do that. And, and I think that they are beginning to include the heritage sites, Black heritage sites in some of their programs. And I also like to see their marketing budget include Black travel media. I hear complaints about that all the time that um, the tourist boards and other, com and other companies are just not targeting Black travelers when Black travel is uh, what? Almost a hundred billion dollar industry. So we have the, all money is green, so we have the dollars. So I, they just need to uh, show that we are represented. Representation is very important because when people go to a place or when they see a workforce in the travel industry and they don't see themselves, they don't feel like they're a part of it. They don't feel like they're welcome to the destinations that don't have black uh, representation. Okay, I'm also a part of the National Cultural Heritage Tourism Center, which is working hard to do just that. We're establishing societies around the country that will um, promote uh, the cultural heritage sites. And we have people on board to uh, show people, show tourists around when they come to that city and introduce them to the um, uh, cultural heritage site of people of African, African descent. I believe that the world could use more organizations um, like the, um, well, some of the ones that I mentioned and like the um, what am I trying, uh, 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 tourist blogs that we have because promoting culture, diversity, culture understanding is necessary because understanding of each other cultures breathes peace. If different races and cultures develop an understanding of the other, this world would, this would help to combat racism because understanding is, um, 
It leads to harmony in throughout the world. Travel medium, travel media, tourism boards, travel agents, and other in, uh, entities in the travel industry can take a key role in educating the public and travelers about the importance of diversity and understanding of different cultures. Um, what, what most people consider travel fun, leisure, happy making, but that does not mean that it does not include biasness and racism in, tour, in tourism. Most Black people can recall an incident of prejudice this, when they were traveling, whether it's just sitting in, in first class on an airplane and being uh, stared at strangely, probably because you're Black and traveled in first class. A lot of us have experienced that. Or even sometimes when you're in a, a very nice hotel, sometimes they mistake you as a staff member or even sometimes the maid. So um, education would help travelers to be sensitive to things like that. So in closing, I would just like to say I would love to see the tourism industry take a lead role in bringing people together to promote inclusion and diversity. Addressing racism is a part of responsible tourism. Um, the travel industry can and must serve as a voice against racism and uh, as or moreover, a voice for inclusion in almost uh, every aspect of the tourism industry. So everyone in the travel industry must speak out, even on an individual basis, and collectively as part of organizations, as part of uh, uh, travel agents or whatever part of the industry that you're involved in, we must all work together during this pivotal time in world history because I think most people have heard that Mark Twain said that travel is fatal to prejudice. So um, the travel industry, I believe, can be a key uh, entity in promoting cultural heritage tourism as one aspect of combat racism and including, uh, promoting diversity and inclusion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Pope, for those valuable insights. Thank you. Our final You're presenter right. is Ms. Tanisha Barnes, the owner of T. Barnes Global Lifestyle the founder of the Black Freedom Colony and the executive director of the Mwasi Creative Community, currently located in Morocco. She is truly a global lifestyle entrepreneur. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Tanisha Barnes. Thank you so much, Timothy. Thank you so much for inviting me into this this amazing conversation around race and travel. Um, as you said, my name is T Barnes. I'm a global lifestyle entrepreneur. I am the founder of the Black Freedom Colony and Wasi Creative Community and the owner of T Barnes Global Lifestyle. Uh, my life's mission is to move my people towards freedom. And the freedom that I'm seeking is a reconciliation of ourselves to ourselves and reclaiming our history beyond the mythologies, reclaiming our cultural traditions, our spiritual practices, and reclaiming our healing modalities and our ability to decenter whiteness and live authentically at the center of our own story and to do all of this through travel as global citizens throughout the world. Uh, I'm always reluctant to name my business a tourism company uh, because travel for African Americans is so much more than exploring the world. It's deeply political, it's a resistance, and it's freedom. Um, I think I'm taking a bit of a different approach to some of my panel members uh, because while I recognize anti-Blackness and racism as a global entity, um, I actually think that that travel, particularly for African Americans, uh, creates a, a level of freedom. And I think that the way that we understand race and racism very specifically within travel um, can be 
um, misconstrued based on our understanding of the American experience, which is why this idea of a very global and broader view, I think, becomes very important. Um, African Americans are perhaps the most free people on earth. Uh, we can move around the world with very few limitations and more than even most Europeans or anyone else in the world. And uh, it's the strange positioning uh, as both oppressed and privileged. And when we find the power in this intersection, we'll realize that freedom was always a choice and our responsibility to take by any means necessary. Uh, when we when we use this experience of domestic terrorism in the United States uh, against, and, and we use it uh, that they use against us to, to build our compassion for the world and uh, to use the privilege of the American passport to move throughout it, we discover parts of ourselves that we never knew existed. We realize we were never bound to the land that abuses us. We challenge imaginary borders. We find people we never knew were our tribe. We push at every social construction, racial, gender, cultural barrier. And we realize that being born from tradition or being torn from tradition um, and tribal alliances can also be a gift. Uh, we feel the impulse, we feel the pulse of humanity at its core, and you'll understand yourself as a child of the world. You belong anywhere and everywhere. And it is at that point that you understand your freedom, you embrace it, and you never let it go. Uh, for me, it's past time that we begin to recognize borders around countries as a social construction. And as humanity moves forward, um, I believe as Mr. Uh, Raif, they talked about, you know, this is a human right. Uh, as humanity moves forward, uh, it's more important to recognize ourselves as global citizens without the boundaries physically and mentally. And those that are global will move through the world as a bridge to new experiences and creating new ways of living together and recovering old ones. I believe that we find freedom through travel. Exploring the world opens us up to see ourselves as ourselves outside the boundaries of race in the United States. Uh, Black people in the US find ourselves at a crossroad with a country that has honestly never recognized our citizenship or reconciled our humanity. And we ashamedly fight the same uh, fight as our ancestors 400 years ago. And so I believe that with travel, it is our it's our passport to be able to expand ourselves beyond these borders. And we are exploring. And you know these facts have already been presented before, but I'd like to reiterate them, particularly for the travel industry, because I think that they're extremely important. As it relates to the tourism, African-Americans are traveling. We're the fastest growing tourism market in the United States. Uh, we valued uh, our travel increase, increase from 48 billion in 2010, to 63 billion in 2018, to 109.4 billion in 2019. The cultural travelers, um, as Kitty Pope has pointed out, uh, spend the most amount of money on the ground of any travelers that are traveling, uh, about $2,078 per trip. Uh, so we're out there. And so now I'd like to kind of speak a little bit more candidly about what I'm seeing in the industry. Um, so like I said, yes, anti-Blackness, um, racism, all types of isms are, are real across the world. Um, and I think that there is a extreme responsibility for us to begin to uh, ask that our travel industry professionals educate themselves on the market. Um, Forbes just came out with these really great articles around African-American travel. And I think that that has encouraged uh, the market to see us differently, right, from a financial perspective. But if you're out traveling the world and you're out planning travel as I am all over the world, whether you're in Africa or whether you're in Europe, you are still seeing that people understand the European or white American market as the core and getting them to decenter whiteness, getting them to deal with the um, in, intrinsic bias that they have around white supremacy, which affects all of us all over the world, is a challenge, right? Um, so that is one challenge that we face. What I find interesting and the, what I'd like to talk about are the challenges that I see uh, interculturally. And um, the things that I would like to, that I do very, um, that I feel like I'm doing very effectively, well, maybe maybe I should leave that, let that to for my, my participants to decide, but what I feel like I'm doing um, 
what I'm putting a lot of energy into is really getting my traveler to start to deconstruct themselves and how they see themselves in the world. What I found with um, working particularly with African-American tourism is that uh, when you have a relationship to money, class, travel, uh, you can often go out into the world uh, acting very much like your oppressor. And that uh, creates um, a boundary between you and the experience that you're able to have globally. And so I've been doing a lot of really interesting work on getting my travelers to deconstruct their own uh, privilege before they travel, whether they're traveling to Africa or to Europe. Um, it's very interesting when you engage yourself in that way, uh, the way that other people change and relate to you. And I think that this is a, an encompassing conversation. It's more than the industry. It's all of us as individuals deconstructing how we see ourselves, how we find value. Um, because travel can, you know, pump you up, you know, sitting in those first class seats can make you feel, you know, really powerful sometimes. And being able to go to places that maybe people locally could never attend can make you feel a certain kind of way. And I find this conversation to be really interesting because I think when we start to be very thoughtful about how we engage the world, the world engages us differently. And um, I am learning that as we go through this process of exploring, expanding, and creating this travel industry and, and using, um, using our differences to connect with each other, that uh, I see things becoming very different. Um, and I think that's a responsibility for us too, as people that are within the tourism industry, to make sure that we're working with our traveler uh, in addition to working with the industry. Uh, and so uh, I don't have much more to say around that, but I think that that is kind of a different perspective from what we've talked about thus far and really speaks to this idea of human rights. I think it kind of touches on what everyone has said. We've all had you know, experiences in the world. Um, one thing I do want to point out is that I do think it's very important to classify the difference between anti-Blackness and racism. Because one of the things around uh, travel, because it's so necessary for African-American people to travel, simple comments like, well, racism is everywhere. It becomes destructive to people wanting to explore. If you already are within a society where people believe that this is the best place on earth to be, right? And they've been brainwashed to believe that there's no other place better than America. Everybody wants to come here. Why would I go out? It really limits their ability to want to continue to explore if the narrative is that racism is everywhere. When in fact, you're not necessarily always engaging racism, right? And, and that has to be talked about because we have a lot of, I found people misinterpret culture they misinterpret language, they misinterpret body language. Um, and these things are really small details that you have to teach yourself as a traveler to deconstruct and to sometimes hold back your opinion about what is actually happening, what you're actually engaging with within a society and a community. And um, it expands. My, my biggest fear is that as we talk about racism and discrimination within the travel industry and you get a, a young African-American person that has grown up in the American school system that believes that there's no place better on earth than the US and they hear racism is everywhere, why should I go anywhere, right? Um, and challenging that for them to be very careful about the way that they think about these things, I think is very interesting. Um, I am less interested in American tourism, uh, although I had a wonderful, wonderful set of parents that took me to all 50 states before I graduated high school. And so I have had the benefit of traveling through the United States and experiencing what that's like. And I know how powerful that was in my life. Um, I'm much more interested in the global um, aspect of travel because I think for African-Americans, that's what holds that freedom. That's what holds uh, the, the next space of imagining yourself beyond the periphery of these borders. And as we're doing this imagining, 
Uh, I want us to be very thoughtful and very careful and um, to have much more um, nuanced conversations around what race really looks like in the world, um, what prejudice really means. You know, when we're talking about caste in India and we're talking about colorism and how you relate to that, we also know that if you go in as an, Af as an American and you're darker, but you have more money, that system looks different for you. You're treated differently. And getting people to understand how all of those things work, I think it opens up and expands your relationship with the community that you're engaging with. It doesn't mean that you're not gonna have somebody that's gonna treat you terribly in the world, right? It doesn't mean that you're not gonna experience racism. I really encourage, you know, particularly African-American travelers, you know, start going into Africa, you know, leave some of the European countries to the wayside. You know, I, I travel very little to Europe anymore. I've did that, <laughs> you know, um, but it doesn't mean that when you get into Africa, you're not gonna experience levels of tribalism or levels of race or levels of, of language barriers. And um, I'm very excited about travel. You know, I think even with this conversation of, of stereotypes and racism, it's a big open opportunity for those of us of color in the tourism industry to be able to create these moments of opportunity of expansion. And um, the world for me is like a big playground. I feel like uh, the world has uh, opened its heart to me. I have never been to a country where people have not wanted to love on me and accept me and learn about me. And I think thinking about travel, um, particularly from a race perspective, for for me, it's a, a sense of, of expansion and freedom and my imagination of who I am and who the people are around me um, has been able to just I, it, it, it lights me up. And so when I think about race, I actually think about it um, from kind of a different perspective and more, I think, um, from a perspective of, of expansion. So that is my talk for today. And thank you guys so much again. Uh, Rizzo, thank you so much for inviting me into this conversation. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, Ms. Barnes, for a truly thoughtful and excellent framing of the topic um, today. It was really, really great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am sure you will agree that we have been richly fed this morning. What an awesome group of truly knowledgeable presenters who gave us deep and insightful information. I would like to ask you to please now unmute yourselves and join me in giving a big round of applause to thank this wonderful panel for a job superbly done. Thank you guys. It was so wow. wonderful and so emotional. Great, <laughs> thank excellent. You. Thank you. Excellent. Now please join me in thanking Mr. Reza Sultani, not thank only for so his much. vision in creating this outstanding session thank today, you, but also in the execution of his vision. Thank you, Mr. Sultani. Thank you. Uh, if I may Thank add you. also, uh, Dr. Ludo Amor, President of International Institute for Peace Through Tourism, he's here too. Uh, oh. Thank you so much, Lou. I don't know if you can hear me or not. It's great to see you here. Thank you. Also many Thank colleagues you. from... Black Lives Matters and all other organizations. Thank you so much. So I think, uh, Timothy, if you don't mind to continue with if there is any questions or if somebody want to talk How about you, Talib, if you want to say anything more. Thank you so much. Thank I you. want to thank again everybody here and particularly Mrs. Barnes for concluding with such a wonderful premium. I want to add my voice to her call. Why don't Black like Americans travel to Africa first? I think Africans need to see them. They need to see Africa. That's what the roots are. I think it's a good answer for many of issues we're talking about. I think Africa should be a prime destination. And now is the time to do it. Thank you so much. I agree. I agree. Thank you for that. Yeah. Anyone else? 
Yes, uh, good day. Um, my name is Cordell Riley. Um, I'd just like to make three points that I think encapsulates uh, all that the uh, uh, speakers have been talking about. This, this, I know where you are, but this morning, it was morning for me until a few minutes ago. Um, it reminded me of this book called Drawing the Color Line by Marilyn Lake and, and others. And one of the interesting things I learned from that book was that passports were the were developed to keep people out of the country. So uh, we talked about tourism being a right and, and travel being a right. It, it was not only in theory, but in, in, in the practical sense. Um, but passports were developed to keep people out of the country. And we've seen that during uh, terrorism and we've seen it during the pandemic where country can say you're not coming based on your um, passport. And the other point I want to make, two, point, two more points, and I'll be very brief. Um, it's, it's sometimes it's not so much uh, the incident, which is uh, racist, it's the way one is treated. So um, one can travel and be pulled out of a line for a, pre uh, for a, 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 a legitimate reason, but the way the person is treated, particularly the person of color, they can be treated less then. And um, I've had that experience. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have uh, connections where I can say, well, wait a minute, I can call this person and have my fortunes tuned, turned around simply because I had those connections. So it's not so much the incident, but how you're treated once that incident takes place. And the third point I'd like to make uh, with regards to, I think it was something that Dr. Lee had mentioned about the impact of travel. While the press, very few people, less than 1%, I think, of, of color who, who travel uh, to these national parks. And I'll just give a practical example. My daughter, um, I'm from Bermuda. We live in Bermuda. My daughter was, uh, was uh, uh, selected to go on this trip. She was in high school to South Carolina. And... Um, it was to stay at a, at a university, I think it was Clemson, for one week. And I thought it was a good thing for them to learn about college and what it's like to stay in a dorm, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we were then going to go from there to one of the mountain areas where you have these uh, idyllic uh, uh, cabin cottages by a river, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, oh, would it be great? My friends had been up there. They were white uh, and they enjoyed it. But when I thought about it during the, the, during the Trump era, uh, would it be a good idea to travel to South Carolina out in the rural areas uh, during that time? And unfortunately, uh, we decided that we wouldn't go with too much of a risk uh, to be out there at that time. So um, part of the reason uh, you may not travel to these areas is because we are perceived at risk. Because there's so few of us who travel there, um, you know, I wouldn't have a problem traveling to a major city, but I really thought about the safety level with incidents of racism rising uh, in the United States under the Trump administration. It really did have an impact on whether or not I would travel to a rural area. So I think that was uh, the three points I wanted to make. Thank you very much for the invite to this presentation, and I continue to uh, listen. Thank you. So Thank much. you, sir. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? Yes, can I make a comment, please? Okay. Um, I'm Birgit. I'm in Germany here today. Um, fantastic comments today, and I'm delighted to be part of this again. Um, I so much agree on all various perspectives. Um, I think I'd quickly like to introduce myself a little. Uh, some people might know me from around. I'm part of IRPT and African Tourism Board and obviously um, part of Trinet. Um, I come from the industry way back, actually. My first job in industry was at uh, Air India in, in Sydney. And then I worked in the industry with travel agencies and hotels and resorts. Eventually became an academic. And my last post was actually in Dubai at Zayed University uh, with a specialization in tourism with a background similar to um, um, Dr. Lee, actually, with uh, letter management. Um, I find now very fascinating today, you know, the combination of industry perspective and academia coming together and exchanging what we're dealing with uh, regards to this discrimination agenda. Um, I've experienced it many times uh, when I was working for Air India as a blonde in Sydney going to India, I was looked upon by Indians because I was blonde and I looked different. So I was also on the receiving end, the other way around. 
Um, then when I was in Dubai, of course, there was no uh, racism that I felt. I was very integrated. I always find the United Arab Emirates is very open-minded and very welcoming of different um, races and nationalities, etc. cetera. Uh, however, when I came back to Australia, actually from uh, Dubai, and this is probably what initiated me writing the book, is uh, again, I came across racism. And people said, oh, where have you just come from? I said, I lived in Dubai and worked at that university. And the comment there was, oh, how could you live there? The Arabs, you're blonde. It was the epitome that really upset me. And um, so I've been receiving that kind of racism that you talk about within the African-American uh, context. And the Indian context was also raised. And I think it applies across the board. It doesn't matter what nationality per se we come from, because we're all multicultural. We all have different cultural backgrounds in us, whether it's a family culture, education culture, etc., work culture. But we should not forget that, and we're all diverse. But the focus, I think, whether it's in academia or industry, is always straight away the national culture and it's a national identity, rather than we are complex people, and we should bring that about and, and share that. To me, that's what the joy is of travel, obviously. Um, I'm very passionate about it. I've been, obviously, into it from across the spectrum of industry and academia. And now I'm trying to get my message out there with a book and, and do events and, and bring the message out that we need to really pull that together. I am very much working also with Lulu endorsed my book as well, uh, because it's about the peaceful traveler and that's the theme. How can we promote peace and avoid conflict? And with racism, we are dealing with conflict. And conflict really arises from three major core issues, which is lack of access to resources, worldviews, and power and control. So if we're looking at industry and educating everyone, we need to look at educating the demand side and the supply side. And having worked in industry and getting exposed to people in the industry, I find there's a lack of understanding, a lot of ignorance about these agendas that we have today. And of course, it's also on the demand side. There's a lot of work to be done, and I really hope that we can do a bit more than uh, having these lovely Zoom sessions and get the message out on a bigger picture. So I'd love to be involved with that, so please you know, get in touch with me, and then we we'll take it from there. So that's all I wanted to say today, and thank you very much for having me here today. It's awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Um, any other comments or questions before we bring the session to a close? All right. Well, we've now come to the conclusion of this morning's session. Thank you all again for your participation, your time and your support. Until we meet again, this concludes the webinar on stereotypes, prejudice, discrimination and racism in tourism. Be well. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much, Timothy Marshall, for the great Thank job you. that you did. Thank you so much. From tomorrow, the recording of this webinar will be available on our website, tourismwebinar.com. And thank you so much, all of you. It was great. It was so emotional. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Riza. Thank you, Riza. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Riza. Thank, thank you. you. Very informative. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. Hey, Lou. Hello. Hello, Tim. <laughs> Good to see you. Great job, Timothy. Happy Great birthday, job. Lou. Happy birthday, Lou. Thank, again. thank you yeah. very much. Again, again. Great job. Great, great session. Thank you. It was good. It was good, Teresa. Thank you, Timothy and Thank you so much. Thank you.